Krai, my name is Swapnil, and I am joined here today by my two Labradors, actually, um, 12-year-old Mindy and six-year-old Milo. I'm a technical writer advocate at Redockly. Uh, what is Redockly? Redockly makes API design and documentation software with a goal to improve the developer experience. So our suite of products, they transform your um, open API definition into comprehensive and interactive documentation. Now, the reason I'm here today is because I'm really passionate about documentation. I've been a technical writer since 2006 and have worked as a contractor on a number of documentation pro projects across software, engineering, finance, telecommunication, and startups. Amongst other things, I also initiated the Write the Docs community in Australia with help from some awesome community members. Now, firstly, thanks for coming to this talk. I'm going to be talking about putting the tech in technical writer. It would have been really awesome to present this in person in Portland this year, but as things stand, virtual is where things are at. So there we go. Um, now, this talk is aimed primarily for technical writers who are currently thinking of moving from a, what you see is what you get, or WYSIWYG for short, tools to markdown and docs and, uh, and docs as code. It's not a huge leap, but there are some mental hurdles. Unsurprisingly, some of the grounding for this starts with the tools and processes you actually have right now. So here's the thing. Organizations, they rely on tools and processes that make it super efficient to use the same language to collaborate and to reduce the friction between contributors. My talk is for folks who want to contribute to learn and grow with the team. Also, getting up to speed levels the playing field for members on a team. The inspiration for this talk comes from, a, from an incident last year. Now, right in the midst of the chaos that was 2020, I interviewed with a really awesome company mid last year. And after an initial interview and a tech writing test, I spent a couple of hours talking to some other people in the organization. All things considered, I thought I had interviewed reasonably well and the conversations was, uh, were really excellent. And then came this email. How many times have you heard this before as a technical writer? You think you've had a great interview experience, well over three hours of talking to various people in the organization, cracking the tech writing test. Their words, not mine. But in the end, it somehow came down to this. Look, I'm not grumpy. To be fair, this was for a developer documentation role. So a good understanding of technical concepts and coding would be a huge bonus, no doubt. But the role was essentially creating documentation for developers. So I think I would personally rate working with and collaborating with other technical teams and being able to read code, I would rate it higher than specific programming experience. Or it may be the case that they had a slightly different interpretation of the word tech when it came to um, technical. I'll be honest, this put a real dent in my confidence back then. You know what? However, hindsight is an excellent thing and it forced me to think about how I could have represented my tech skills better in a role like this. So when I talk to other technical writers who, have had, who I've had conversations with over the years, I realize I'm not alone. It's true. Technical writers for all their superpowers of communication, we often fail to demonstrate our various skills effectively. Where's the tech? Where is the tech? Like I previously mentioned, my confidence took a bit of a hit with that sort of feedback. What I really found amusing was that though, I thought I'd actually demonstrated, you know, sufficient tech experience during my interviews. Just before the interviews, I had played around and built like a custom built portfolio because I knew that was going to be a part of the interview process. So I used a combination of Markdown, Git, Hugo static site generator, um, just to build my own, like, you know, technical writing portfolio. It had examples of some other documentation I had done around APIs and developer docs and technical specifications. So that begs the question, where and how do technical writers actually transition from being just product writers to adding a bit of tech to their arsenal? Now, admittedly, Docs as Code is a great opportunity for technical writers, especially to level the playing field. 
but even if you're not doing anything of that yet like even if your organization's not there yet or you're still working in you know in environments or places where that's not a thing yet um there's still plenty of take around now stay with me and we'll find out let's start by looking under the hood of uh, the tools that we commonly use as technical writers not in a docsis code environment just you know it's just proprietary or stand alone or desktop tools because often the solution is right under our noses as technical writers we may not have the time or the inclination to experiment with a lot of shiny developer tools but you know what if you poke and prod the tools we already use there is enough scope to get your hands dirty with some low tech um low code tech maybe just enough to speak the same language sometimes as the rest of the technical team now right up to 2016 or 2017 so about 4 or 5 years from um before this my standard tool chain consisted of desktop tools like microsoft word help authoring tools like matcap flare and image editors like you know snagit or matcap capture you know what is good about these tools there is enough tech you can sink your teeth in to be able to add value to your docs just beyond writing you don't believe me let's look at what i uh, mean so microsoft word a well known trick with um, the new sort of microsoft word docx files is that basically there are a collection of xml files which has a ton of information about the document that is otherwise hidden now this is really handy for a number of tasks like include uh, it, this includes recovering data from a corrupted docx file to extracting images out of a docx file and other media as well now you think how is that useful a couple of ways at least now let's say a fellow tech writer sends you a docx file but you don't really have access to your you know word editor or whatever you're using for for um your documents you can simply make changes using the xml version using you know things like a notepad app and you can send it back to them and it does the job like it's pretty low low code low code low tech but it does the job surprisingly even if your developers are also using something like python to automate parts of their you know um software releases they can easily create and modify um word documents they can also read text from a docx file programmatically so it's possible it's just that we have to make sure we get do take an effort to actually look under the hood of what the tools that we already using now almost all authoring tools you, they allow you to manipulate content in some sort of an xml format which instantly gives you more power and control of what content you actually creating now for example this is a screenshot of a matcap flare um a user interface the split view actually allows you to view your documents in simple text and also xml view which allows you to understand how styles work and uh, how they render during the final output so if you can read like html xml that's actually good you 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 going a lot more deeper than just your standard you know um documentation a lot of the help documentation tools also the look and feel is driven by cascading style sheets or css so you, you've already got a head start on the design without any developer help on this this is exactly the kind of tech that you know front end developers and designers use so you're already there with with tools like these let's think about images vector images scalable vector graphics at the base of everything they're pure xml based um files you can open up a an svg or a, a vector gra- a image in a text editor and you can make whatever changes you want to to an image especially add layers or call outs or whatever you can even um resize images using a text editor and that's fantastic now the take away here from all of this is that regardless of the tools that you use as writers there's always there's always enough tech to learn to be able to manipulate docs and content programmatically Now let's have a look on the other side of that fence now. I'd like you I'd like to share my journey on how I transitioned from, you know, just pure product documentation into more of a docs as code methodology. Now hopefully this benefits a few technical writers out there looking at making this transition. There's quite a few things we need to go through um and just you know get into that space of what is docs as code? What are the different components that make up docs as code? So have, let's have a look. 
Now, Docs' code processes, they're not that different from a normal tech documentation lifecycle. Like you still need to be able to plan your documentation, gather information from your subject matter experts and use issue trackers to keep track of the progress that you're doing on documentation. And for some strange reason, we somehow still magically haven't eliminated the need for a docs review that and the headaches that come with it. But you know what, with Docs' code, what it offers is, is a far better aligned review experience since we're already using the same tools and workflows as rest of the, the technical team or the product team, we can actually weave in reviewing as a key activity. And we'll talk about this in, the, in a later section. You'll also be surprised how communicative and share friendly developers, I'm uh, sorry, I mean, subject matter experts can get via uh, pull requests. Let's, let's dig into this a little bit deeper. So if you are a tech writer, transitioning from a products or a user interface or a WYSIWYG environment to a Docs code environment. This or some version of this is how your tool chain is going to look like. So you've got issue trackers, similar to you know, your standard issue trackers, keeping track of your documentation. Um, it's probably the same as what the developers will be using, but you might have your own um, you know, Excel spreadsheets or whatever it might be. Um, plain text. Now you can forget fancy UIs when it comes to plain text and we'll go into that in detail a little bit um, later, but you're looking at plain text tools, you're looking at version control. So basically something that allows you to keep a history of your changes and also automation. We'll talk about that automation a little bit later in, these, um, in this presentation as well. What about the process? So just as Docs' code tools match the, soft, the tools used by other software teams, the work processes that tech writers follow can also mirror the processes used by software teams. So the most common software development methodology right now today is probably Scrum, which is a form of an agile development process. When tech writers adopt the same sort of methodology, um, developers they're working with, what, what happens is there's a bit of a change. They, bet, they better understand the... Um, tech writers processes and workflows. Now, for example, if you follow a process like this, so you've got plan, you break down your ta task into tickets and you estimate efforts and assign tickets, you write and review. So what happens is when you have a plan, when you follow a process like this, um, the whole product team is aware of what you're working on and when to expect documentation for review and when documentation gets published. So there's a little bit of a cadence to the whole, whole process as well. Now, coming from environments where you're probably working outside or alongside agile teams, providing this sort of um, structure, it helps team members like, with, with better visibility and accountability towards your documentation. Learning just enough. Good. Now, this funny story, I was actually working on this slide and had it open on my screen for a second or so uh, when my nine-year-old walked in and he said, and he saw it and he said, Hey dad, why are you using swear words in a work presentation? It's it's not about that kid. So let's let's there's no denying that a large number of software products these days have some sort of version control housing the code. One of the things that new technical writers would benefit from is learning how to use Git. It's a popular distributed version control system. While a lot of product managers and technical teams might assume that you know knowing Git is second nature these days, surprisingly you'll see a lot of writers still has haven't been exposed to this sort um, to Git before, and this they might find it confusing. Now the trick with this sort of tech is to learn just enough to be able to contribute meaningfully. Now I've made plenty of mistakes before I even got close to doing this. So I mean, everyone goes through their own. A pattern of learning something new. If you're already part of an organization that uses Git, you can schedule a 30 minute walkthrough with the development team and they'll be more than happy to show you how to use it. Now, Git is one of the key building blocks of Docs' code. So you should find plenty of support for your interest in this. These are the most Git commands that I started with as the part of the Docs workflow. There are a few others, but if you can get up to speed with these initially, you would have done well. You know what, actually I lie. While I did read up on these commands and what they do, I wasn't that comfortable using the command line interface. Now these are more like a command line interface commands when I say that, um, and I still only use it sparingly. 
If you are a visual person like me, you can easily use a graphical user interface tool to interact with your Git repository and make the transition a little bit less daunting. So it shouldn't hopefully scare you away from Git. The, the good thing about these tools is that it visualizes the branching workflow. And when you branch or merge changes, and we'll go into this, what, what this means in a minute. Um, and it helps you understand the flow of commits um, when you do that into the main branch. Now, while we're talking about branching and all that, let's look at how you, you would use Git in your documentation workflow. Once you have a handle on the Git commands that I showed previously and the tools around it, the next logical thing would be to try and understand how the rest of your team uses it in their workflow. One of the more popular approaches of um, the workflow is something called as a GitHub flow. And we'll talk about this in our next slide, but you might also be familiar with a similar workflow in your workplace called um, a trunk-based development. Right, so let's talk about GitHub flow. If you're a technical writer who has never worked with this sort of wizardry before, let me assure you that I haven't met a single person who hasn't stuffed this up at least once. So you're not gonna be the first. This image, this screenshot, uh, it basically represents a kind of a basic GitHub flow. So the main or the master branch is where everything production level lives. Um, that's your code, that's you know live code. This is the first horizontal line on the top if you're looking at the image. A lot of the organizations will have some sort of access control on the main branch. Now, let's say you have to do something, you have to create documentation using this workflow. Well, all you do is you um, basically create a feature branch and you go nuts on the branch. So where it's a, on the diagram where it's got the arrow pointing downwards, so it says a feature is you create a branch for your documentation and you go nuts on the branch. You, you wouldn't be you know, doing anything terrible. Developers, will similarly use a feature branch for adding their new code, but you can work separately to this. Once you're happy with your work, you've had it you know, reviewed by whoever needs to review your work via the pull request, you can merge your changes back into the main branch. Now, the, good, the beauty is docs and code, they can live on separate branches, but essentially what you're doing here is you're using the same tools as the rest of the technical team. So you're going to increase your chances of collaboration happening. I mean, one can hope. I've been on projects before where an otherwise grumpy or a time pressed SME will literally sing and provide endless commentary on a pull request. So I can tell you that it works. Now this is the beauty of a distributed version control system. Everyone works on their branch and merges all of it together once it's all tested, reviewed and approved. Now, Remember this slide that I showed you before about the 10 most you know, common Git commands? Now let's relate it back to your workflow. So now that you've under, maybe understood how the workflow is of using Git, um, the first three commands, basically what, what are you doing with these first few commands is you're essentially creating your own branch. So this is where you, you know, go on to the feature branch and you start creating your documentation. You set it up for your documentation. With the next few, um, commands, what you're doing is you, that's that's your that's your stage. That's where you're doing your dance off with your reviewers, your subject matter experts, making sure that the content is accurate. It's got, you know, it's got enough information. It's got the right information. So that's that's your dance off right there. And with the last two commands, you do get an opportunity to undo any mistakes that you might have done before you merge your changes to release or publish your documents. So this essentially is then tying it back into your workflow. Now let's move on to something more writer friendly. If you thought that was a little bit more, you know, technical or not necessarily what you would want to pick up right away, let's move on to something more writer friendly. Now, when I personally moved from Visivic tools um, to plain text, you know what? I felt a bit powerless. Essentially, this was because I'm a visual person, so I need to look at how my documentations will look like when I write something. So, Word or whatever tool you're using, um, it allows you to, you know do that using a help authoring tool like Flare, I can quickly generate a preview and see how my overall documentation will look when they're published. It's a classic writer's fallacy though. Plain text is actually a writer's dream. Remember all these years we've had aspirations of separating content from design? While we've been you know, steadily making progress via data and other technologies, 
plain text just simplifies things even further so what's so good and what's so not good about you know plain text the good things about plain text is it's so easy to read um, plain text um, or markdown um before it's you know rendered by html and you can even write it so quickly like the writing part is so easy like you can write rich formatted content extremely quickly you can also learn how to use it in a couple of hours and that's probably overestimating it you can if you're you have you never worked with plain text or mark plain text languages like markdown or restructured text or ascii doc before you can pick it up in a couple of hours it's not a huge learning curve it's also incredibly lightweight and it's usually free to create plain text like some of the tools out there they're really free to create plain text it also doesn't interrupt your workflow with the need to you know click buttons and worry about how it looks like visivig editors they're great like they everything's built into a user interface but usually they'll require you to click buttons to achieve any sort of formatting if things like bolding or whatever it might be um you also have to learn the tool first before you use it which takes the focus away from the actual content or the writing part and the good thing about and last good thing about um plain text is it's platform agnostic so your content is not tied to whatever you're using to create plain text it's it's just a mechanism it's just a method of creating something it's also really well suited for version control tools like git because of the diffs what what i mean is what this means is that the it's way easier to find out what has changed between two updates in a documentation than anything else and your docs as code tools really complement um, each other really well there are a few criticisms around plain text though i mean nothing major and there are more inconveniences than issues but yeah i mean depending on what plain text format you use you might be limited by what styles are available and again it's not a big big thing but you just might be um, limited there and if you like me are coming from a visivig tool you might find that lack of formatting a little bit daunting or unsettling at first almost like a loss of control um but trust me plain text is far easier to use and more importantly it makes collaboration really easy like not everyone on the team wants to learn a new tool for reviewing and providing feedback and so on and so forth but plain text removes these headaches uh, there's hardly anything can, anyone can get wrong with plain text i mean it is plain text at the end of the day the beauty of using plain text or something like markdown in this example on the screen is that you can leave the documentation design to the rendering engine um, or convert or and happily craft your documents in plain text most of the text editors um, allow enhanced previews um, so the one on the right which it's actually a preview of the code on the left so it actually allows you to see what your documentation or that particular topic is going to look like when you build it um so let's while we're talking about previews let's let's talk about previews then I remember working on a project once and this is not a docs as code environment um before where I was writing content in a help authoring tool um getting it out to review via pdfs uh, manually updating content based on feedback once i receive it and repeating this until everyone was happy once this part of the documentation life cycle was complete it was then on to the next one which was making sure i use some sort of a document management system to publish the final deliverables or store it somewhere create a web request to publish the documentation onto the public website wait for approvals from upper management and then publish the docs once the approval came through now imagine having to make these changes to your documentation every single week and going through this process repeatedly now it wasn't with that previous example it wasn't as if we could automate we couldn't automate any part of this but the issue was the strict regulatory processes set in for some other business documents that got applied to the um technical documents as well so literally using the same brush in a docs as code setup this issue would have been addressed by something called as a continuous integration and continuous delivery in other words automation is awesome as i mentioned in the not so docs as code environment reviews was a major sticking point especially if it involved multiple tools or processes or you know um the workflow and some smes sometimes they just do not want to come to the documentation party the review process is largely left to whatever tools surround it and you need to use you know proprietary tools to sometimes fit within your documentation tool chain 
Now this adds a lot of overhead, not only for the tech writers, but also the rest of the team who may not be that willing to learn these new reviewing tools. In a, in a soft, working on a software company project once, I remember I was using a help authoring tool um, and I tried using a very specific review tool that worked really nicely with the help authoring tool. And I thought that's, that's good because it's you know integrated with the tool. I can easily make these changes into my documentation. But the developers flat out refused to use yet another tool and you know things came to a pretty heated debate at one point. Guess who lost? The technical writer. With the docs as code workflow reviews are innately built into the process. Now this allows for quicker turnarounds on feedback and more tolerance towards the documentation process. There is an increased level of transparency in the process. When it comes to previews, most Visivic tools, they have their own preview feature. This is good because it allows you to visualize the structure and how your documentation ends up looking. With docs as code, you can either have you can either preview individual topics like I showed you previously in the one of the earlier images, or um, you can automate the entire site previews via con continuous integration or CI for short. Now these are mechanisms that allow you to do the same: preview the overall structure and layout of your docs. Personally, for me, what you see is what you can improve. So it's Wiki pretty much in that sense. Effectively, within a docs as code environment, you're using the same tool chain. The rest of the product team is. That makes the docs flow so much smoother and quicker, in my opinion. Continuous delivery with documentation means rebuilding your output by simply committing and pushing content into a Git repository. So remember in our earlier, some of our earlier slides where we went in through the Git workflow or the GitHub flow. Let's assume you've made a few changes into your feature branch and you want to actually, you know, um, get someone to review it, all you have to do is just, you know, commit your content to that uh, feature branch. The way the continuous delivery works is it picks up this, detects this change and it triggers a new build and a publishing job. So this, it greatly simplifies the act of publishing. You don't have to do anything. It's all set up for you. The beauty of this is as a technical writer, you get to focus on the content and worry less about how your docs are going to get published and delivered. I mean, of course, as a, as a tech writer, as a part of a product team, you can provide input into this process when you start the project, but it then becomes the task of the robots to do this for the, all you have to worry about is automating it once and get back to documenting. And that's, I think is a win-win for everyone. Another brilliant thing about Docs' code is that you get to customize your tool chain up to a certain extent. This is also the part where collaborating and getting buy-in from you know, your management becomes easy. Now, I remember a time when I literally had to beg the management to get our tech writing team a decent reviewing tool. We ran into all sorts of administrative red tape around security and cost justification and access control. The result did happen. We ran ourselves into a wall. On the other hand, um, just tying it back to another project that I worked on. I asked the manager permission to use some alternative tools, pretty similar to the dev, what the developers were using, but more customized to me as a technical writer and was given an instant okay to um, use these tools. I mean, look, I understand how managers see tools in a time to learn versus a time to deliver paradigm, but the latter always wins. In the docs as code instance, technical writers can use more or less the same tools as the rest of the team and they can be productive more quickly. And that's always a good thing for everyone. Now, you might remember this slide from the beginning of my session. Now let's summarize by putting some context around each of these links in the chain. If you're a technical writer transitioning from products or a UI environment or a Visivig environment to a docs as code environment, or some version of this, this is how your tool chain would look like. So issue trackers, you could have something like Jira or Asana to have, keep track of your documentation issues. Plain text, like I mentioned before, you could be using Markdown or restructured text or ASCII docs. Now there are other sort of plain text editors and formats and um, so on and so forth, but these are more of the popular ones that I put on this slide. Version control. Generally um, Git, but you could be some using something else like Mercurial as well. Um, automation via continuous deployment and some sort of a local preview of your documentation site. 
So there's a number of um, uh, continuous improvement tools like Circle CI, GitHub, GitLab, Jenkins, Travis. Redockly has its own version of the CI tools as well. So there's plenty of options out in the market if you need to, you know, get yourself familiar, familiarized with that sort of thing. Now, between these four links, you can customize your tool chain to any tools that you like. Whatever your combination, you can tailor it to your unique needs as a technical writer. Now, for instance, I built my um, tech writing portfolio last year using the Atom editor for Markdown, GitHub for version control, and the Yugo static site generator with GitHub Actions. You can use anything else, any other plain text language or a different version control systems, and your docs will end up looking more or less the same depending on the theming. <laughs> As a wise man once said, docs or it didn't happen. Now that you have a grip on the tool chain and customize it to your particular taste, document it. There will be a time in the future when you roll off a project and need to hand it to someone else. Each tool chain is going to be different at each place you work. So don't forget to write down the internal tool chain docs that you would want to read as a new writer on your project. Plus you can take it to your next project or your next interview and demonstrate the text that you're familiar with. To summarize, I have enjoyed that transition from that WYSIWYG environment to a more docs as code over the last few years, but that does not mean I have shut the door to WYSIWYG tools completely. One of the things I've learned is that it's really important for technical writers to stay curious and keep learning about technology. Learning about more about the products themselves, creating videos, doing usability testing, asking questions about use cases, they, they also count as improving tech skills. Learning how to read and understand code helps too without actually knowing how just to write it, in my opinion. Putting the tech in technical writing is not something a person can do just once and be done with it. It does not work like that. Now to wrap it up, here are some resources on how to get started with you know, the Docs code tools and processes if you're anywhere on this journey. These are some personal ones that I've really found useful. Maybe they'll provide value to you as well. And that's all folks. I'll see you over in the Q&A room to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, sounds like the stream has ended. <laughs> I'll just wait for people to trickle in. Uh, maybe now is a good time for, for you to pan your camera towards your dogs. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, let me can see them. Oh, they're both oh. sleeping. <laughs> Gone off to sleep. They've been up with me <laughs> since <laughs> five this morning. So yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> oh my God. And how old are they? Nine and twelve? Yeah. Uh, so the brown one, Milo is twelve, and the white is Mindy. Oh, sorry, Milo is six, and Mindy is twelve. Yeah. Okay. They're not siblings, are they? No, they're not. No, 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 no. They're rescue dogs from different, different, um, yeah, organizations. Yep. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so many people are so excited. <laughs> I knew that was gonna come up. <laughs> the cat, cats versus dogs, perhaps. Oh my God, endless doggos. Look at this chat. <laughs> um, we do, yeah, as usual, we have just um, nine or 10 minutes. So um, let us get started with, with, um, with some of the questions, but I also wanted to just add some of my notes if that was okay. I mean, just kudos on this talk. I, I think one of the things that jumped out to me was the, the fact that so much on uh, the journey of, um, uh, I mean, the transition of working in a docs-like code environment, whereas before uh, we have heard lots of presentations on why docs is is, is appropriate. And um, I think a lot of us loved your sense of humor, um, the story you shared that shows some of your vulnerability, and the, the sense of empowerment that you've given people um, to, to learn uh, the tech. Um, I'm going to pop over to some of the questions that we have received. Uh, sure. These questions about where your dogs are. Um, I'm going to jump to Christy's question about um, whether you recommend learning Git uh, from coworkers, or are there any tutorials that you might recommend? Yeah, I did put in a couple of uh, references in my slide, but I think the um, the Atlassian ones, and there's also just the Git 
um the the kid the git book i think it's called um which is like a good start on for if you haven't worked with git before um and then obviously if you go into an organization and if they have like specific tools and they've they have got like specific processes it's always good to brush up and you know check and cl clarify how that um sort of sits against the standard practices maybe they've made some tweaks or you know maybe 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 they've added something to their own workflow so it's so starting off with those resources and then going in an organization and learning from coworkers so a bit of both i guess thanks i'm looking at a question um about plain text I, it's from um ila Sayed, if i'm pronouncing that correctly um they asked if you need cross references conditional text variables uh, is there a plain text way to do those uh i think there is i think in some of the play, the the kind of uh, stuff i'm working on right now we do have a little bit of snippets and markdown snippets we can use so reusability is definitely one of the things you can do um condition wise i think you can set up conditions depending on what what tools you're using um but yeah i probably need to explore that a little bit further yeah um not to go too if this is something that um, might be addressed with restructured text rather than markdown. Does that sound about right? Yeah, those things, I think, uh, yeah, they do vary. The markdowns look pretty basic, but I think um, the restructured text and even ASCII docs are a little bit more of an improvement on that and when it comes to plain text editors. and stuff ASCII like doc, that. that's right. I think yeah. I saw Eric mention ASCII doc in our chat. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Kim had asked a similar question, um, and I'm going to go to... Oh, wow. Another question from Sarah. Um, also related to plain text, uh, Sarah asks, is the value of plain text potentially diminished because I work somewhere with a robust and established? Um, so I'm, I'll probably need like more of a context there. I, I, Sarah saying more in terms of it, because they've got like, I don't know, better processes. Is that why you're thinking markdown is not too much of a value is that I'm, I'm not sure i got the context around the question could me maybe you could read it again um i mean uh, yeah i might ask sarah to reiterate in the in the in the chat um because i think i did read it almost verbatim but um aha we have all the other aspects of docs's code uh sorry a docs is tools workflow but still use xml and authoring software for writing the content Ah, okay. Yeah, I see what your point is. Um, yeah, I have worked in environments where uh, I think it's more the fact that they're not confident. From my experience about technical writers being embedded within the same tool chain, it's more the fact that you have to convince them and, you know, even have like a proof of concept of we're using this authoring tool and we're using, you know, XML. Um, but if you want to get into Docs code, uh, because the most of the other team is using it we, we are happy to demonstrate using the same sort of tool chain so using markdown or plain text and um you know i, I think that kind of is what the question was okay uh <laughs> looking at my other screen in regards to some more uh, questions um hey, um Michelle has had a question about Confluence. Uh, she says that her her docs, or sorry, her team's docs, go into Confluence. Um, what markup or markdown might you recommend to use prior to importing into Confluence? That's an excellent question. I, and unfortunately, I don't know the um, what, what goes behind Confluence. I, I'm pretty sure it's not a straight markdown. I think it's still largely XML driven. Um, but I think I might have to explore that a little bit further as well. If, like specifically for Confluence, what sort of markdown would you require? I, I know it does like XML pretty well, but I'm not sure about straight markdown. Okay. And then I'm, you know, we've got some questions reiterated by uh, Wendy and Eric about uh, translation or localization, uh, if I'm reading correctly. Um, and I'm not sure if I quite understand them. Uh, do you, let's take a look. Um, so if you need to localize our translation agency with markdown source docs. Yeah, see this, this unfortunately translation and localization is something I've never had to work with. And it's a bit of a sad thing because 
you get a lot of software documents which have to do that and have to factor that in with with some of the work that i've done i've never had to work with localization or translation so unfortunately i can't answer that unless there's someone here who's worked you know with markdown and is happy to chip in with with a really solid sort of answer to that yeah i mean if if i may ask for some clarification i'm missing some piece of understanding because i'm not i don't understand what uh, because I'm thinking of the asterisks and the am I missing here? With yeah, the markdown I, syntax. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe, yeah, like, like I said, I'm sorry, I can't help with that because I have <laughs> translation, so I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss of, you know, what, what, what is the one that, what is that issue that um, prevents it from being translated well? Or maybe the dogs have an answer. <laughs> Oh, there's Israel. someone there with an answer which says translation and internationalization ah. works, yeah, works perfectly well with Markdown. Okay. Okay, maybe one more question. Um, in the same vein as maybe localization, uh, Kathy has asked about content reusability. Uh, how hard do you find it to manage reusable components with Markdown? Yeah, it's a little bit tricky. Like with with Markdown specifically, I think you need to have some sort of snippet functionality, and they're not straightforward. Like some of the help authoring tools that I've used in the past, um, they do snippets really well. With Markdown, they the the thing with Markdown is there's a lot of things like tables and stuff that don't render well if it's within a snippet. So if you add that to a snippet and then try and reuse it on another topic or something, they get like I've seen things break easily, um, but yes, you can reuse content in Markdown, but I'm not sure it's hundred percent there yet. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, and okay, so at this point, I'd like to start to wind things down. Um, I'm going to ask uh, for you to reiterate to everybody if uh, they'd like to. Might be a good way to get in touch. Uh, and any last words you might like to share, and then I'm going to uh, make an announcement, and then we will move on. So um, what's a good way to get in touch with you, Swapnil? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, Swapnil Ogle. I'm on LinkedIn, Swapnil Ogle. So I think that's probably the best way. Uh, plus on the Slack, the Write the Doc Slack, I'm there as well as Swapnil Ogle. So yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Easy to find you. OK. Um, and our announcement is that um, Janine and I will be taking a break from um, moderating the QA sessions, and we'll be hosting an uncommon see third culture or somewhere in this intersection so uh, i hope to see you some of, some of you there I'm stumbling over my words and otherwise um thank you so much swapnil and thank you everybody for for joining us here sorry can i just add one quick thing before we leave and uh, it's early yes, days please. but i just wanted to um make a pitch for we, we, the write the docs australia okay. and india conference is happening this year on the second and third of december and details will follow soon We'll see you there <laughs> and <Yeah>. here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Swapnil. Thank you.